Father, as we turn our hearts to your word now and continue our study in Genesis and this uh, very important passage about the Tower of Babel and uh, what happens there and how it's impacted the world in such a horrific, evil way, a false religious system that even makes its way into the church of Jesus Christ. Lord, and we know that from scriptures, uh, Babylon, and this mystery Babylon will play a, a key role, Lord, in future events. But Lord, help us to, to not have a Babylonian heart. Help us to see what uh, really is the, uh, the essence of, of the concern here for this tyrant who rules the world and this false religious system. So use your word. Help us to have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. We, uh, we used to only hear about this idea of a new world order at prophecy conferences. A lot of Christians, you know, that's a buzzword, and they know we're talking about the fulfillment of scriptures, that there will be a world leader referred to as the, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the man doomed to destruction. He's known by a lot of different names in the New Testament, who will arise out of revived Roman Empire and set up his own little one world dynasty and with it is a one world religion that one world religion is referred to in uh, by john in revelation 17 as mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth so there's a false religious system called mystery babylon it begins in genesis 11 right here with a man named nimrod it's played a, a strategic in a sense a ne in a negative way against uh, God's people throughout the ancient world. And uh, as we were in Revelation 17, we, uh, we talked about the fact that uh, uh, when we read the Old Testament, the gods of Baal or Baal or Molech, all of these false gods that plagued the people of Israel uh, that came with the Canaanites and the Ammonites and so forth, all trace their roots to mystery Babylon. Uh, experts tell us that uh, the roots of this religion can be found in Egypt and in India and in Pakistan and uh, in the Middle East and really around the world. It says that it's a mystery, John says, in a, in a Bible sense, New Testament, that means something we didn't know that's now been revealed. And he's revealing in uh, that account of these future events what's going to happen in the role of this false religious system. It's the mother or the source of false religious system. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Hinduism, whatever else it is. In essence, there's part of that that can be traced back to Genesis 11 in Mystery Babylon, this religion here that will be the last world religion of the end time period. So very interesting as we get to the historical account of, uh, of Genesis 11, our concern should be what it does in our own lives, Francis Thomas, in just a portion of one of his poems, says about Babylon, and all man's Babylonians strive but to impart the grandeur of his Babylonian heart. We're going to see that in Nimrod, the grandeur of his Babylonian heart. What is that? <laughs> it is like self-centeredness on steroids. It's, it's, uh, it's what world leaders have strived for. But the concern is, that thinking can get into the heart of every one of us. We see it kind of epitomized in, in world leaders, though, and certainly Nebuchadnezzar was one of those guys. Remember, as he overlooks his own city and uh, considered one of the wonders, seven wonders of the ancient world, uh, we, we call it the Hanging uh, Gardens of Babylon, Daniel quotes him as he says, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power is a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. And then God did a funny little thing with him. We had the first werewolf that's in the Bible. I know that's a popular thing, but it really is in the Bible. It started with a guy named Nebuchadnezzar, and, and uh, God dealt with him harshly to humble him and bring him around. But certainly we would say he had a Babylonian heart as well. You've got King Herod, where at a point in time, appearing before a crowd, wearing his beautiful new uh, a uh, garment that uh, shimmered in the sunlight and the crowd was actually saying, are not these the words of a God? And Herod's going, yes, I am. And then God dealt with him as well, a Babylonian heart. Alexander the Great, Caesar Augustus, Louis XIV, Stalin, we could go on. Of all those world leaders, 
that have a Babylonian heart, but it's something that can uh, affect each and every one of us because we have it every time, as we'll see, we do something to make my name great or make my name known. And there is something that is in us that drives us to do that, that's in the fallen nature. Uh, and uh, what drives it spiritually goes all the way back to Genesis 11 here. We uh, mentioned also that uh, Moses, uh, last week as we went in Genesis 10, said that Moses intentionally takes these two chapters and he flips them chronologically. Because he wants us to know the, the outcome of the Tower of Babel before he even tells us about it. He wants us to know the genealogies and what happens to the sons of Shem, of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth uh, and their descendants, where they come from and where they go as God scatters them because that's what he has to do. He wants us to know the outcome of what he does here before we even begin to read about it. Again, it's just another uh, insight into Moses in terms of his literary skill, trying to help us understand the story and be warned of the story of Genesis 11. Well, let's look at uh, the first thing that I want to mention, which is the, the reign of Nimrod, which again is given back in chapter 10. We looked at it uh, briefly last week, but verse 8 to 12 says, Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erak, Akkad, Kalne in the land of Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kala, Razin, between Nineveh and Kala, that is the principal city. So Nimrod is described as a, as a mighty one, as a mighty hunter, the, great, uh, the grandson of Ham, the great grandson of Noah. Uh, but what he is is a mighty tyrant in the, south, in the sight of God. He's not a hunter of animals. He's a hunter of people. Uh, we're talking about a historical character. I quoted one reference uh, off a manuscript or a stone last week talking about uh, an extra biblical source about Nimrod, that he was a hunter of people, that he was bloodthirsty, and that he was in rebellion against Jehovah God. Uh, we find his name all over the archaeological ruins of uh, the Mesopotamia area. So when we talk about the Tower of Babel, it's not a Sunday school story. It's an actual play. It's an event that, did, that, uh, that happened. Uh, interesting, I, I, uh, I remember several years ago, and you probably saw some of the articles when we first began to learn more about uh, DNA and the complexity of DNA. Uh, and as scientists began to study it more, came to the conclusion, the realization that, that all of us came from uh, a common man and a woman, that we all of us share a common DNA at its uh, source. And they believed that it was traced back to the ancient Sumeria culture in Mesopotamia. By golly, that's what the Bible said all along. And, uh, but, uh, so that was uh, uh, kind of big news several years ago. Uh, in my reading and studying this week, I, I found that uh, there are many of those that study languages that say the same thing. That all languages can be traced back to one common language in the ancient world, in the culture of Sumeria, on the plains of Shinar, just like the Bible says. Very, very interesting. So again, just a reminder that when we read about these things, and this man, Nimrod, he is an actual historical person. But he certainly is a type of the future Antichrist as a world leader. Notice he's mighty for himself. He's a mighty, mighty hunter of people. He's against God, and he builds his kingdom. He is the founder of the Babylonian Empire, we're about ready to read about. He organizes the enterprise of the construction of the Tower of Babel and then extends his kingdom to Assyria. So let's get to chapter 11, the city and the tower of the rebellion. And that's in verse 1 to 4. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So again, they are, we say rebellion, because they are doing the opposite of what God said. God said to Noah and his sons, when you come off the ark, scatter. <laughs> 
uh, go over the face of the earth and multiply. And they said, we're not doing that. Actually, we're doing the opposite. We're going to gather, and we're all just going to stay right here. Uh, and he's saying, no, as we read last week, it was necessary that they scatter and become many lands and nations and peoples and languages and families because as we saw at the end of the message last week, Paul tells us the reason for that, why that was God's plan in Acts 17, is that so that men would cry out and come to know the living God. That God had a plan that involved every language and people. It was ne necessary for them to not group together in one language, in one empire. It was necessary for them to spread out. And they're saying, I don't think we're going to do that. In fact, this guy says, I think I'm going to build my own kingdom. And in fact, I think we'll kind of have our little religion thing going on here. Somebody gets the wrong idea and starts worshiping Jehovah God any longer. And that's the essence of the, the rebellion. Notice the rebellion occurred during a time of unity. One language, one speech. One language literally means one lip or the same words. And uh, uh, again, it, uh, it was something that was uh, designed or allowed them to not be in obedience to the Lord. And of course, the solution to the problem is God will come and confuse the languages. Those in the rebellion, notice they traveled together and they travel, they journey to the east or eastward, which becomes uh, in Bible talk, just another phrase to say that they were leaving God and they were leaving the presence of God because they were going east, eastward. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they were kicked out of the garden of Eden and they went east. When Lot left Abraham, no longer wanting to submit to him and his authority, he traveled eastward. Abraham's sons by his concubine Keturah went and were sent away with Isaac, and they were sent eastward to the east country. Jacob fled his homeland in rebellion and traveled to the people of the east. And we could go on and on. It's just a phrase. Moses carefully using it, even where they go in the direction is indicative of the fact that they were migrating uh, away from God. Uh, Moses clears uh, uh, this all, clears up the other statement. He says, and they settled there, verse 2. It's not uh, uh, incidental. It's the opposite of being dispersed. So verse 4, let us be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. They are doing the opposite of what God had asked them to do. Uh, the third thing about the rebellion is they, they built more than a city and a tower. And, and it is true in all of these archaeological ruins. And we mentioned last week that in Iraq, present-day Iraq, where the area we're talking about, there, there are 24 ziggurats or towers that have been excavated. We're talking about one in particular. We'll give you some details about uh, in a moment. But in each case, the excavation uncovers a city and a tower. Sometimes we, you know, get those uh, Sunday school pictures, and I'm going to show you one in a minute. You know, this, uh, this like open plain, you know, this tower in the middle of nowhere. It wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was always a city and a tower and a very complex city uh, at that, uh, at the same time. Uh, there are two temples with towers that is suggested are, is the actual Tower of Babel. One is the temple of Marduk or the, the moon god. Uh, the other is the temple of Nebo. Nebo ends up being a city, a Canaanite city. And when Joshua and the children of Israel come into the land, just the name of the city after it's taken over, they, they wipe it out and change the name because they knew it was the name of a Babylonian god. Uh, that uh, is the place, the temple of Nebo, that most writers, most archaeologists, as well as traditions handed by not just Arab sources, but Jewish sources also say is the Tower of Babel. Uh, and it is located in the city of Porsippa, now called Bears Nimrod. So even the, the name of it suggests that it was the, the temple and the tower that Nimrod built. Located on the west bank of the Euphrates, its ruins now extend 150 feet into the air. The tower at the time it was built was 300 feet uh, in, uh, in height. And, uh, and we know a lot about it. We have ancient descriptions of it. We have uh, other historians going way back, like Herodotus, that write about it as well. It was built in seven stages, uh, uh, multicolored on the way up. The top, the sixth stage, was usually a, a darker blue, sometimes with stars on it, because it was the idea it was above the stars or into the heavens. And the top of it was silver, uh, uh, again, 
in adoration or their patron god, the moon god, Marduk. Uh, on the way up, there would be other areas uh, where there would be, in a sense, little courtyards and places they actually called chapels, places where they would be uh, worshipped to other Babylonian gods as well. Uh, it's a very highly developed culture. If you, again, if you want to read more about it, it's the Sumerian culture, if you uh, want to Google that later. But uh, we're going to look at Abraham next, uh, next time as he leaves Ur of the Chaldees, uh, a complex city. Sometimes we think of Abraham as being this guy cruising around on camels, living in a tent and so forth. And that's what he does once he follows God. But that's not what his life was like. He was not nomadic or anything. He lived in a very sophisticated city. It had a sanitation system throughout the city. The city was planned out with streets at right angles. And we kind of assume that, yeah, well, what's, what's the big deal with that? But you don't find a lot of ancient cities like that uh, until you, you start digging back in, uh, in time. It was not a primitive culture. It had housing developments and, uh, and what we might consider tract homes and so forth. So it's a very complex society that we're talking about when we look at Abraham and we think about Nimrod and, uh, and the Tower of Babel. Uh, in terms of that's the place, but the practice of their religion becomes very significant. Uh, their religion was the worship of the Madonna and child, the mother and child, which permeates again. It's the mother of religions, so it permeates into, it becomes the source of religious life. In, and there are many Madonna and child cults around the world. And of course, uh, the concern is we'll see that this religious system ends up morphing into aspects of Christianity over time. The mother's name was uh, Semiramis. Uh, she was the queen of heaven. She has a son who is supposedly virgin born on December, December 25th. Does it like ring a bell to anybody? And uh, uh, when we talk about these things coming into uh, Christianity, it was known as Yule Day and you burnt a Yule log to commemorate it. You could bring an evergreen tree into your home to talk about the the new life that was given. And there is so much uh, uh, that is common to us that we have no idea the, uh, the roots of it. Uh, it's just uh, uh, amazing. And, and, and it goes on and on. Tammuz was at one point in time as a young man was bored, uh, gored by a wild boar while he was out hunting. He was killed. He lay dead three days and three nights and then he was resurrected from the dead. It was in the springtime, so they celebrated as they celebrated the goddess Ishtar to commemorate the resurrection of Tammuz. And so we have a holiday called Ishtar. This is all from the, the Babylonian. The early church, what did they celebrate? Passover. <laughs> and uh, did they celebrate the birth of Jesus? Don't know when that is. Uh, but, the, but these things end up coming into the church, spreading and becoming part of of Western culture, the dying of eggs, all of these things. The idea of a, of a uh, the election of, uh, uh, of a pope type leader, this all goes back to Mystery Babylon. Even the clothing, the uniforms, the robes can all be traced back to Mystery Babylon. It's, uh, it's truly uh, amazing. Now, one of the things that, that happens and how it migrates from ancient Babylon <coughs> is an interesting story as well. Uh, because at the fall of Babylon, and of course when we study that in the book of Daniel, we read about that as the Medo-Persian army comes in and takes over at the fall, the priest moved to a city in Asia Minor called Pergamos. Well, we have a little letter and comments from Jesus to that city and to the church that's there uh, in the book of Revelation. In chapter 2, verse 13, Jesus says to this church in the city of Pergamos, which is the center of the mystery Babylon religion in the first century. And he says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas my faithful, uh, was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Satan dwelled in the city of Pergamos, which is the headquarters of the mystery Babylon religion. There's an altar of Zeus there that can be traced directly back to Baal, uh, a god of the Babylons, Babylonians. Uh, these uh, priests then migrate further west. They cross the Aegean Sea, 
between the first uh, and about the third century, and they settle in another city in the, uh, in the country of Italy. You may have heard of it, Rome. It was the headquarters, certainly, of the Roman government. Why did it migrate there? Because one of their great high priests was a man named Julius Caesar. You may have heard of him before. Ran the show in Rome for a period of time under which he takes on the name Pontus Maximus, the great bridge builder. And after him, remember, Rome begins as a republic but becomes an empire as it's taken over by succeeding Caesars or dictators that rule, rule the country. From Julius Caesar on, they all assume the religion of Mystery Babylon, and they all assume the title Pontus Maximus, or the Great Bridge Builder. Short term for that is Pope. In 476, when the Visigoths sack Rome, uh, although it was already decaying and already destroying, that was kind of the final blow, there no longer is a Pontus Maximus. There is no longer a Pope. There is no longer a Roman Emperor. So now the Bishop of Rome, who's been struggling, and you can read the letters between the different bush, bishops from Alexandria to different places in that part of the world as to where the headquarters of the church at that point should be, given the fact there's no longer persecution since the edict of Constantine ending persecution, uh, where should the center of power be for the Christian church at that point in time? And the Bishop of Rome said it should reside here because we are the headquarters for the Roman Empire. So once the last emperor reigned and used that title, he took the title on himself. So beginning in the late 5th century, now you had a leader of the church taking the title of, of Pontiff Maximus, the great bridge builder or the pope of the church. It comes right from Mr. Babylon. And I'm really sorry if you come from a Catholic background and never heard this stuff before. Please don't shoot the messenger. This is just the historical events, and it's well documented. It's well documented. And there were, there were just things that, that, that fell and came right into uh, uh, the church uh, itself that comes right from a mystery Babylon. There's a, uh, today in Haifa, Israel, there's a, uh, a monastery, a Carmelite monastery, that at one time, uh, before the fall of Rome, was a temple uh, to the Babylonian religion right there in Haifa, their port city up in the, uh, up in the north. Uh, the man that was the high priest uh, of that temple, his name was uh, Damasus. He lived uh, in uh, 366 to about 384. Uh, he's there ruling. Uh, and when the Roman Empire falls uh, and when the, the uh, bishop in Rome takes that title, he is appointed as one of the bishops of, church, of the church there in Israel. He comes right out of the Mystery Babylon Temple as their high priest and steps into a role being a bishop of a church. So you have this complete intermingling between these two things. All the say, it all begins in Genesis 11. It all begins with a man named Nimrod whose name means rebellion who was a hunter of men and was bloodthirsty and said, I will build a tower. I will build my own kingdom. I'll build my own religion and it will be a complete rebellion against God. And God says in his word that it becomes a mystery and it becomes the mother, the source of false religious systems around the world. When author Morris Knights notes that uh, the essential identity of the various gods and goddesses of Rome, Greece, India, Egypt, and other nations uh, with the original Pathion of the Babylonians is well established. It's very easy to trace them back there. So there's the place, the Tower of Babel. It's an actual place, the archaeological site that uh, some of our men and women in uniforms may have passed through there and seen it on their way or flown over it at some point in time, sticking up 150 feet in the air. You might have seen it uh, if you were in the vicinity. It's an actual historical place, and so is Nimrod. His name is dedicated on monuments and written all over the archaeological remains of the Middle East. But it's more than just a place. It's a practice that has created problems for God's people through the Old Testament as well as through the New. The purpose was to, as they said, maintain unity in opposition to God and notice, make a name for themselves. Moses gives us a couple little sound bites. You didn't think of Moses giving sound bites, but he did. He said, quote, come, let us make some bricks and bake them thoroughly. Uh, they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. That's a sound bite. 
And uh, I appreciate this, if you think about this, because this tells me that Moses had this little bit of sarcasm in his writing, in humor, which I do from time to time. So when I find it in the Bible, it helps me justify it. And so I always, I always like it when I can find it. Notice what he's saying. He's saying, these guys, what did they build with? Bricks. Not like us guys, stone. It's not like a good Israeli stone. They made some little brick. What did they, what did they put them together with? Some translations would say slime. Uh, I think uh, uh, the old uh, King James says slime. Uh, here it says uh, asphalt. What do we use in Israel, Moses says? Mortar. He says, their building was a joke compared to ours. Uh, so he throws a little comment in there. But again, the thrust, let us build ourselves a city, or for ourselves, a tower uh, in a name. One ancient uh, Hebrew writer writing a commentary for the Torah, his name is Nahum Sarna, says, rooted in earth with its head lost in the clouds, it was taken to be the meeting point between heaven and earth and as such the natural arena of divine activity. On its heights, the gods were imagined to have their abode, constituting the obvious channel of communication between the celestial and the terrestrial spheres. The sacred mountain was looked upon as the center of the universe, the navel of the earth. I'm pretty sure New Age guys use that term, that term today when they talk about Mother Earth and Gaia and all this stuff, the, the navel of the earth. It, uh, it all goes back to ancient Babylon and this religion. Their desire, again, was to make a name. And um, very interesting. It's kind of ominous. And Moses very careful in his writing. The only other place we find that previous to this was the Nephilim of old that we looked at who were the men of renown who made a name for themselves. And as we saw, were really demonic entities that had come down to thwart the plan of God and the promise of God to bring a Messiah through a woman. But uh, so very, very ominous in this idea uh, of their name. And of course, to Moses, their name would become a joke compared to what would happen to them. Now, as we get to chapter 12, it's interesting because as God calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldean and makes these promises to him, we call it the Abrahamic covenant, promises in the land, uh, the Messiah would come through him, all the earth would be, uh, be blessed through him and his descendants and so forth. And he says, and I will make your name great. I want you to leave a group of people that build, build the tower. And again, through the genealogies, we saw that uh, the, the, one of the men born at that time, his name was Peleg, which means divided. And the text talks about how the world is divided at that point. Those that would follow false gods, those who would follow the true and living God, and they, remember, they, they crossed over the river Euphrates, and that word cross over means Hebrew. That's where we get the name for it. They would cross over and leave that world behind to a world that God was going to give him. And Abraham, we read about him. He was moving towards uh, a what? A city whose builder and maker was God, as opposed to a city he would build for himself. He would have a name made great, not through himself. It would just be something God would do, and then God would get the glory for it. They were all about making a name. Even the Messiah comes, and Paul says about him, he made himself of no reputation. Right? He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. What did he give him? A name that's above every name. Everything that man is trying to do on his own, with his own, pull himself by, up by his own bootstraps. This is pretty American stuff here, isn't it? Self-sufficient and all that. And, you know, we, we like to be able to do stuff ourselves and everything. But God says, you know, you're a lot better off if you're just completely dependent upon me. In fact, it's, Paul says it's in your weakness that you're strong because then my grace can be multiplied upon you. And we certainly all need the grace of God. It's a radical statement when it says they will make their name great. Now, I know that none of us have ever said that or had any thoughts through that. We're just completely humble people and we just serve others all the time. And it really doesn't matter to me who gets the credit for anything. No, it's not true. It's not true at all. I, I, we just, we, we live in that sometimes. No, I told that story. No, no, I did that. No, I was the one. What, you know, and we, we get into this. I know when I was, uh, 
designing and building stained glass windows, uh, which I did for a couple of decades uh, and more than a decade ago. But uh, when I first started, that was, uh, that was such a thing to try to build a name and a reputation. If you're going to be able to get any jobs in the business community, it's going to be on your name and your reputation. And, uh, and I would uh, d- do a commission and get it done and try to photograph it and keep a record of it. And then the ones that I thought uh, might interest somebody, I would uh, uh, <coughs> do it in black and white, write a few notes about it, where it was located, find some little twist or story that might interest one of the writers at the uh, Star Bulletin or the advertiser, and then send it all off to them in the hopes that he could look at this and go, my work is done this week in the Sunday home section because I've got a story and I've got pictures, I'm going to go with it, which they would sometimes. And so I would do that periodically with magazines and so forth. Why? I wanted to make a name for myself. I want people to know my name. Uh, But, you know, it's so different when we come to faith in in Jesus Christ. And we look at the example of Jesus Christ. The whole world is divided between those who are crossed over that river, the river Euphrates, and say, I'm not going to live that way anymore because I know what it leads to. Babylon gets destroyed in the end, right? Isn't that like a good place to hang out? Yeah, it gets wiped out in the end. That's not where we want to dwell. It's not where we want to live. Well, let's look at the response of God in verses 5 to 9. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down. They're confused their languages, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So the response is seen when God comes down. It's not the idea that uh, God is so far away up into the heavens. I think I see what they're doing down there. I better go down and get a better look, see what's going on. That's not it at all. It is the idea that God is watching, and he does see, and he does know the hearts of men, and he is involved with what's going on in the events of the world and the events of our lives, and he does come down. Now, again, it's also interesting. It's the same language used in, uh, in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and God came down. In the cool of the day, remember, he comes down to see what's going on. That's not a real comfort if, if you're doing some sinful stuff that God's watching. He's going to come down. It is a comfort, though, when you're going through life and facing its difficulties to know that God is watching. And he does see. And he does come down. And he is involved. But you can imagine, again, the idea, and even the mockery in Moses' language, that these guys could simply build something and and overthrow the power of God. Isaiah the prophet says in Isaiah 40, 22, it is he who sits above uh, the circle of the earth or the sphere. That's why uh, men like Christopher Columbus that believed the Bible knew that the earth was, uh, was round. By the way, the whole concept that Christian says the earth was flat was invented 200 years later by the atheists and the critics of Christians. It was never true. It was just one of those rewrite history kinds of things. Uh, the great thinkers of the past were believers, uh, and they knew that, uh, that the earth was a sphere based on Isaiah. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Their tower is uh, uh, microscopic, but the all-seeing, all-knowing God comes down to see. He watches over the affairs of men. He realizes who loves him and who's in rebellion against him. The response also is tied directly to the unity of the people. Notice one language, one people, and the concern, nothing they propose will be held from them. God's not in heaven wringing his hands. Oh my goodness, if they go much further, we won't be able to control this situation. That's not it at all. This is God's grace. He sees what they're doing, and they're leading again, like the time before the flood, to their own destruction. They will destroy themselves if they continue. We've got to come down and do something. Uh, That thing, us, appearing all the time. Jewish people have a real hard time with that when they keep saying God is us. (laughs) And so, uh, but we know that uh, God exists as 
uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's a reference to that. They come down and they confuse the language as a solution by his grace so that mankind will not bring further judgment upon himself. We talk about the judgment of the Tower of Babel, but truly it's the grace of God as well. Why would God bother to do that? Peter tells us that he's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. And so there's even the grace of God in the story of the Tower of Babel. Uh, and again, the response included a solution to simply confuse the languages. It was a mercy of God that did this. Uh, and very interesting as we have the, in a sense, the reversal of it at the uh, day of Pentecost when Peter stands up to preach in a language that he does not understand himself, Glossielia, but the people that were out there each heard it in their own dialect and understood simultaneously exactly what was uh, going on, kind of the opposite of this miraculous uh, uh, event that took place. My own theory is that uh, here in Hawaii, we are the opposite of the Tower of Babel. You have one people, one culture, and they spread all over the world. And if you haven't traveled outside Hawaii, you may not appreciate it, but here you have the reverse, where you have people from many cultures becoming one culture again. What culture is that? Local. <laughs> A man fled the scene, appeared to be local. You know, you know it's, it's, it's the opposite. What does he look like? Black hair, brown eyes, mid-brown skin. Okay, that's about everybody. Can you be more specific than that? It's, it's, uh, it is interesting. We're, we live in a very unique place. And, uh, and, I, and again, I don't think you even sometimes appreciate your own culture until you get a chance to travel out of it. And I think it's one of the things that why people love, love to come here. It's not just the weather and the beauty and stuff. It's the, it's the people that are here because it is this, uh, this blending of cultures and so forth. Uh, just beware if somebody starts building a tower in a city, then we, we could be in real, real trouble. Of course, the language that they speak, what would be the one language they would speak? Pigeon. So, so it's just my own little thoughts commentary there. As long as we stay away from that tower thing, we're, we're okay. But Babel no longer means the gate of God. Remember, that's what the word meant. But now in Hebrew, uh, it means confused. And Genesis links, links it to the fate of Sodom. Uh, as well. Isaiah, again, the prophet says in uh, Isaiah 13, 9, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. Further down in verse 19, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation. It's been attempted to be rebuilt, our good friend Sodom, who's insane, was over there trying to rebuild it uh, at one point in time and declaring himself to be the second Nebuchadnezzar, you know, minting coins with Nebuchadnezzar's face on one side and his face on, on the other. I'm sure those are going for a lot of money on eBay by now. What do you think? Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, he tried to restore it. But the Bible says it will get rebuilt uh, in the future. And, uh, and as we mentioned, the Ezekiel 8 invasion of Gog and Magog of Russia and Iran and a host of confederated states, which includes Turkey as well, which is the surprise twist in, in all of this. If you are an observer of the, of the Middle East and you watch what's going on with Turkey currently, they're involved. But as they do, they are destroyed, which would allow the opportunity to Iraq to be a major player in terms of oil and power in the Middle East. But... The Bible says either way, whether we see it or not, it's going to get rebuilt. It's going to be a head or a center for economic uh, uh, growth. Uh, and uh, in the end, God will judge it, and he will judge it like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. But what it says to us is that this idea and concept of living for yourself, making a name for yourself, leads to nothing but God's judgment and destruction. And he would love us enough to come down and even confuse our language or maybe our brains or our life a little bit once in a while to try to get us back on track once again so that we'll walk with him. Isaiah's prophecies are later taken up by uh, Jeremiah, as we're going to see actually this week in our study, in the uh, midweek study. Uh, Daniel speaks about them uh, as well. And of course, uh, Revelation, Revelation 18 and 19 give us the conclusion of the Babylonian empire. Uh, but for us, it's, I, I think the main concern is to see that 
we can either try to live for self and build a name, or we can cross over the river, be the Hebrews who crossed over in order to follow the living God. But those two things are mutually exclusive, and it's a constant war, isn't it, with the flesh that, uh, that says, you know, watch out for number one. And of course, we live in a, in a culture that, that uh, you know, just really says that's the way to go. And we used to, it wasn't that long ago that culturally, what was esteemed among our leaders was humility. And now what is esteemed among, among them is, is pride. When I was a kid growing up, I remember, you know, somebody would win the World Series or the Super Bowl, and they would interview the, the athlete. I don't even want to tell you how long ago this was. Uh, but if you've never heard it before, then you'll say it's a really long time ago. And they would say things like, well, they'd be all bashful. They'd be bashful. And they, these, uh, the guy that's the MVP of the Super Bowl, or he's the MVP of the World Series. Well, it really wasn't me. We got a great team, our coaching staff. I mean, those guys are so wonderful. And it's like, it's not about me. I just happen to be here. And it, it was just, you, used to, you heard this very humbling thing. And all the sports writers, isn't that a great guy? And now it's like, the interview of the guy, I'm awesome, man. I, I was great. Do you see what I did? Can you play that back on the big screen again? Yeah, it's like, I mean, it's, it's like the opposite. And everybody goes, yeah, we like him. We're okay with that. It's, it's really flipped. So we have a whole culture that actually wants to give us a Babylonian heart. And even as believers, we need to guard against it. Uh, and as I said earlier, Jesus is the example who made himself of no reputation. If we'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, kind of all takes care of itself, doesn't it? And that's what the Lord wants us to see. Well, let's pray.